At the time, I was a 26-year-old female. I'm still female, obviously, but now I'm 32. I loved traveling around Australia, camping in my van, usually by myself, and 99% of the time, these were all amazing experiences. On this trip, I was heading from Mount Kosciuszko in southern New South Wales towards the Blue Mountains, but I wanted to break up the drive for a night by camping in a state park, and maybe take a shot or two at some rabbits with my long bow. I found what I thought to be a perfect isolated stark park where hunting was allowed, and since it was midweek and the weather wasn't amazing, I figured I'd have the mountains mostly to myself. I would not taken into account the quality of the back roads to access the camping site. They were very badly maintained, rock and dirt tracks that my tiny Toyota van struggled with. It took me over an hour to travel the 30 kilometers to the campsite, swearing to myself as often as I could. I was feeling grim and tense when I finally pulled up into the site, but I relaxed pretty quickly as the site was empty of people and I could see rabbits hopping around about 200 meters away in the meadow. As soon as I pulled up beside a designated fire pit, I strung my bow and headed after them. The little guys had obviously already been hunted a few times before though, because I couldn't get close enough enough for a confident shot at them. I left the rabbits to go about their rabbit lives and headed back to the van where I started a fire, poured a glass of whiskey and lit a cigarette. Enjoying being out here in the solitude and knowing that the closest population of people was over an hour drive away. Now, I loved being myself in the bush, but I've got this weird intuition thing that lets me know when I've landed in a safe place or not. A couple of times in the past, I've driven into a potential site, and after a while I get this pressure in my chest and stomach. And when that happens, I bail, no questions asked. After sitting around my fire for a while, I did feel this pressure slightly, but after another whiskey, I decided to ignore it. It was too late in the evening to tackle that road, and I was over the legal driving limit after that second whiskey. Truth be told, I was probably over the limit after my first glass, so I sat there, drinking, smoking, and watching the sun go down. The sun disappeared quickly, and I was in the bowl of a small valley with looming mountains all around me and after watching the first star appear, I decided to call it a night. I dropped two pairs of shoes outside my van door. One was a small pair of sandals, and the other was my massive hiking boots. I always do this when I'm camping alone, cause I hope any creepers might think that there's a man in the van and leave me alone. I fell asleep quickly, but was woken up at 12 a.m. by a gunshot. It sounded like it was on the other side of the mountain, and I largely ignored it figuring that hunters were after deer or a wild pig. I fell back asleep again pretty quickly and did not sleep as deeply as before. I was awoken again by a much louder gunshot from about an hour later. This shot had definitely been fired somewhere inside my little bowl in the bush and it was large caliber rifle for sure. The echo was huge in this confined valley. I began to feel nervous what if they were taking shots and my van happened to be in the way and if they missed their target? I peeked through my curtains and saw my fire still had a few glowing embers. I hoped that the hunters might see it and know not to shoot in my direction. That was my biggest concern at the time. I had no idea shit was about to go to a hell of a lot more intense. For the next hour or so, I drifted in and out of sleep, snapping awake and aware at the smallest of noise. On one of these bouts of drifting out of consciousness, I heard a sound that had me sitting straight up in my bed. I hit my head on the roof of the van pretty hard, but did not even notice as I was concerning and concentrating on the noise that woke me. Tires. Tires rolling and grinding on the rocky dirt track leading to my campsite. Now I'm sure there could be a few reasonable explanations for a car taking this isolated dead road in the middle of the night. I even tried to think of some, but... I failed because I was too on edge and just sat there in my bed, straining my ears to the utmost to try to figure out what this car was doing. Suddenly, my van was filled with a shockingly bright light as the mystery car turned into the campsite and faced toward my van. I waited for the headlights to give way, but they didn't. 
I couldn't see the car. My van has curtains at every window, and like fuck I was parting them to give whoever was out there a good look into the van and at me. I was already feeling pretty spooked, but my terror rose sky high as I realized the car was now slowly driving towards me. The lights got brighter, the rumble of the diesel engine got louder, and the sounded like the biggest tires in the freaking world popped and grated on the rocks underneath them. By this time, I'm frozen into place, too terrified to move a muscle, as this four-wheel drive beast of a car slowly kept driving towards me until it was nose to nose with my tiny van. The headlights were so blinding, even through my curtains, that I had to turn back to face the other way. Then, I almost peed my pants. Whoever the ass wipe was driving this car started revving his engine over and over, harder and harder, and longer each time. It was the most aggressive sound that I have ever heard coming from a machine, and I honestly can't tell you how freaking scared I was. I didn't know it was possible to feel more terror than I was already feeling, but I found out quickly it is always possible to reach higher levels of fear when I heard the sound of two car doors opening. I was too scared to move, but I broke through a fear of paralysis long enough to grab my six inch hunting knife from the shelf above my head. I gripped it with the white knuckles as I listened to a pair of heavy footsteps start walking slowly toward my van. The other person must have been standing just outside their car, watching and waiting, as I didn't hear a second pair of footsteps. Maybe they were more stealthy and quiet. Who the fuck knows? All I know is that my straining ears were focused solely on the slow, purposeful steps of the first stranger as they stopped beside the sliding door of my van where I had dumped my two pairs of shoes. My van was locked at every entry point, but a hundred what-if scenarios were running through my head at light speed. Maybe I could dive into the driver's seat of the van and belt out of there. Fat chance, with them being parked right in front of me, even if I did manage to drive around them, I still had 30 kilometers of rush bush to navigate. Bush tracks that are far superior. I'd be run down by their big truck in a matter of meters. I could string my bow and jump out and confront them, but then I'd never been so keen on suicide, so I thought I'd give that one a miss. I didn't even have a map of the area, so running like a scattered rabbit into the bush wasn't even an option. Oh, the irony. So, what I did do was wait, frozen, in my sitting position, still white knuckling my knife. While person one finally moved away from the side door of my van and back to their car, their engine was revved again and again, as if trying to scare me out. I still sat there. I sat still for what felt like hours, but was most likely only minutes as I vaguely heard voices under the rumble of the engine. I couldn't make out a word, but the voices sounded male. And eventually, it has gotten to the car and slowly rolled away. I know how anticlimactic that sounds, but honestly, I don't really care. At the time, I was so filled with relief, so great that I was almost high off of it, and at the time, so exhausted from the adrenaline dump, I felt like I could sleep for weeks with no worries. I didn't sleep though. Thoughts of just hiding around the corner on the road waiting for me to take a break for it running through my head, as irrational as that sounds. I think was the most confusing and scary thing about it. I just have absolutely no idea what their intentions were. They could have been just hunters, but maybe they saw my fire and thought they'd come down and freak me out. I'm not sure. They could have had a much darker things in their mind though. Could have been locals wanting to play a prank to relieve their small town boredom. If anyone wants to shed some light on it, go for it. After 20 minutes of silence. I finally managed to pry my fingers off the handle of the knife one by one, using my left hand to do it. I put my knife beside me on the bed and sat staring glassy-eyed at the curtain on my rear window, with my knees pulled to my chest until faint light filtered through the material, turning my interior from black to smoky gray. I peeked out the pre-dawn, day, and saw no car, no other people, just more rabbits who I now could not find the heart to hunt. I opened the sliding door and struggled outside, feeling like it was a dream. I made a cup of the strongest coffee in the world and sipped on it while staring distractedly at the footprints surrounding the van. Then I got to the driver's seat and drove an hour back to the main road. I kept expecting to see the car around each hidden bend, 
but really, I would have no idea if I saw it or not. I never saw anything of the vehicle or men who terrorized me. So that was that. I drove on to the Blue Mountains and met up with some Belgian friends and ended up sticking with them for the rest of the six week trip. But I never forgot the feeling of being so scared and so helpless and so alone. Really, if ever, do I choose to camp in an empty campsite now, I'll move to another one with more people. It was in 1971. I was in my late 20s. I was then staying in Rose Hill Moritis, not married yet and staying at my folks. One day, my dad came home with a South African couple. He met them while coming back and they were tourists visiting Moritis with their back bags, tents and sleeping bags. Moritis was still safe in that period, but independence was given by Great Britain in 1968 and a civil war had just come to an end a few months before. Two communities had fought for some political reasons. Anyway, my dad invited them home to sleep over for a few days. I remember the guy had a big blonde beard. He was very kind, his wife was as well, but I forgot her face. We decided to organize camping during a week on the west coast of Moritis in a place called Flick and Flack. This place, which is now pretty developed, was at the time very wild with just a few houses. We went on a Saturday morning, found a nice place to put a tent and organized the day. The South African man and his wife were very good swimmers and divers. We spent a lot of time in the sea, catching fish, crabs, some lobsters, which were getting scarce then, we don't find them anymore by the coast, and cooked all these goodies on a small homemade barbecue set. All of us, mom, dad, the couple and I, really enjoyed the day. The sunset was beautiful, it was warm, and we were in summer, and everything was perfect. When night came, we were preparing a nice barbecue with chicken, beef, and pork, and a few shrimps we had caught earlier. This night was starry. My dad was happy and drunk, and the couple were obviously having a great time. Since we were not fluent in English, I was improving then, communication was a little bit difficult but we could make ourselves understand with gestures and sometimes drawings on the sand. It was a great fun seeing my dad trying to converse with them with a very limited knowledge of English. Anyway, it must have been around 9 p.m. We were all seated on the bench, waiting by the ocean as the starry sky was beautiful and we were sitting by the campfire. Then, we started to hear what sounded like a complaint. We could not determine the sound of it, but it was like a woman wailing. It was faint but clear, since the place we were at was wild and remote. The wailing was not consistent, but it could be heard from time to time. We put it on the some sorts of animals, since we were not people living on the coast and being ignorant to the animals which might have been active at night. We were seated on the beach, facing the ocean, when suddenly we noticed someone coming out from the sea on our left at about 30 to 40 meters away. It looked like a woman with a long white dress just walking from the sea to the beach. We could not see her face, but could guess that she had long hair. The only lights were the stars in our bonfire. She silently made her way straight and disappeared from our view into the vegetation. We found this very odd. I knew it was not normal, but did not know what others were thinking. My dad was drunk and watched the scene with a little smile on his face. I think he was lost in his thoughts. We all looked at each other, and we had no idea what to think. I tried to check if there was a house where the woman walked to. I stood up and walked towards the sea, and looked to my left to see where she went. There were only green bush and trees. There were no lights or any constructions around. I was now scared, because I realized that we must have seen a ghost. I walked back to the bonfire, sat down and told everyone that I did not find any house there. We stopped talking, and everyone kept alert. We could now hear all the little noises of the night. We heard faint crackling like someone or something was quietly walking on dry leaves. Then suddenly, we heard loud flapping noises on a tree nearby. It looked like large birds, pigeons or bats flying away. It scared us. Then my mom told me quietly she felt something was not right. I and her were feeling like we were being watched. The couple was looking around with their glass in their hands. Then suddenly, something heavy fell in front of us on the beach about five to six meters away. 
I stood up to see what it was, but could not find anything. Everybody stood up and looked around, and there was nothing found. Despite the fact that the night was clear and sweat, the atmosphere had changed. Apart from my father, who was in a trip because he was too drunk, we were all scared by then. The couple talked between them and I could not understand. They seemed to be quite concerned about the situation. I did not know what to do. I couldn't say anything because I didn't understand English enough. We were enjoying such a nice time before seeing that woman. It sucks that maybe we couldn't stay there or maybe we would just go to sleep. It was a pity. In the middle of the night, we heard this bone chilling scream like a woman being attacked. It seemed close to our camp. We were on our feet with our eyes about to pop out of our sockets. My heart was pounding so loud that I thought others could hear it. The couple started to pick up their stuff and my dad followed them. Mom and I packed everything very quickly. As we were doing so, some coconuts fell off and rolled down our camp as if someone had thrown them away. We were now scared to death and no one would talk. We heard running on the beach, then in the woods, but could not see anything. We quickly put the stuff in the car, and it was not easy because we did not have a big car. We had taken our time to pack things so they could fit them in perfectly when we came down. Now, we had to pile up things. The worst was the barbecue. It was hot and dirty, and we did not want to leave it. I burned myself twice, trying to put it away. While we were packing away everything, things were happening around us. The scream seemed to originate from different places, and there was a lot of noises going on. We all got into the car and practically practically just squeezed in like a bunch of clowns. I decided to take the wheel because my dad was too drunk. As we moved away, we got a shock. We saw a woman, dressed in white, standing by the little lane looking at us. It was bone chilling. I stopped the car. She was standing about four to five meters away. I didn't know what to do. I was too scared to move closer to her, but it was the only way out. We waited for a few minutes as she was standing there staring at us. I heard my mom praying and the South American people mumbling something between them. Suddenly, we heard a bang like something hit the car behind. We all turned to see what happened. The atmosphere was very tense and I think my dad was becoming sober very quickly. He was now swearing. We did not see anything behind, but when I looked forward, the woman was not there anymore. But the scariest thing happened. She was now standing by my door looking at me. I can't describe the utter fear which took a hold of me then. I released a scream, my throat was sore for several days after, and pushed the gas pedal. I think everybody screamed then. But with panic, the car choked and the woman was still there looking at us. I remember not seeing her eyes or features because it was dark. I switched on the car again and drove as fast as I could. The poor car got shaken on the dirt road. We reached the main road, relieved and shouting, what the hell had we just seen? Fortunately, Rose Hill is not far from Flick and Flack when we reached the town. The car broke down. The film belt of the car had broken and the engine stopped from overheating. Fortunately, Rose Hill is not far from Flick and Flack. When we reached the town, the car broke down and the fan belt broke and the engine had stopped from overheating. We were in the 70s and there was no cell or towing services available that Saturday evening. The couple and my mom walked home which was not far. The South African couple stayed two more days at home and left. We never saw or heard from them afterwards. This encounter takes place when I was 13. In June at the time, myself and three of my friends, aged 13 to 14, who I'll call Sam, Cam, and Ned, take a four-day camping trip on the Wisconsin River in southernest Wisconsin. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Wisconsin River is relatively long, relatively wide, and has long, shallow stretches as deep as a couple of inches to a couple of feet. You have to walk your canoe through some of it. There's moist sandbars that run down the middle of the river as well. The adult on our trip was Cam's grandma. Even well into her 60s, she had wilderness skills on par with Belle Grylls. She has incredible stories from viciously biting home invaders to protect her daughter to hiking through remote mountains at midnight and sleeping surrounded by wild horses. She's a major peace, love, and happiness type from the 60s. She's way into conspiracy theories and nowadays way into Bernie Sanders. She believes wholeheartedly Bill Clinton took cocaine by the brick while in office 
and non-organic foods are corporation mind control. She has reasonable arguments for both. Still, one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. Anyway, we set up camp on a beach about 3 p.m. on our first day. There's a lone, still fisherman slightly upriver from us. This is strange, given we're mostly in the middle of nowhere, but there are occupied properties here and there on the river, so it's not crazy. Immediately, after we arrive, Grandma realizes she forgot her coffee cup in the car. What the hell, Grandma? She decides to go make the kayak trip by herself back up river to where we parked, just to grab the cup and come back. She left alone, us boys, to go off in the shallows. Landscape wise, there's our beach, with dense forest behind it, and a strait about 90 meters across between the beach and a sandbar. We're screwing around in the shallows for maybe 30 minutes, when I remember being on my stomach in the water and looking up at Sam, staring all glazed into the distance. We all look. The fisherman from earlier is on the sandbar about 50 feet from us. None of us remember seeing him getting so close, especially since he has no boat and would have waded through the water. I remember there being a strange glare from the sun, so we couldn't make him out perfectly, but he was thick man and droopy long brimmed hat on. We could not see his face but collectively had the feeling that he was looking at us. It was obvious he knew our adult left and decided to close in. The timing was perfect. Whatever, we just say that and head back to the tent. We're behind the tent for maybe a half hour playing cards and gathering firewood. We take turns peeking around the tent to check on the status of the fisherman. He's moved in, off the sandbar, through the shallows and practically on the shore of our beach. Yes, the river is an open area, but it's unspoken that you would wander into somebody's campsite, especially when kids are alone there. We're weirded out and Sam being a baddest 13 year old breaks the ice by waving his arms and yelling at the man, hey, hey, what's up? No response, but the man turns his body towards us, staring, completely still like wildlife caught in the headlights or Bigfoot in one of those blurry photos. After a few seconds, he does a 180 and just starts walking away from us straight back into the water. Like he intends to keep walking until the water comes up to his face. Cam says something along the lines of, what the hell Sam? And we move to hang on the other end of the beach. It's been three and a half hours since grandma left. We have no idea when she's supposed to be back. We're on the complete opposite side of the beach from our camp, and due to the forest we couldn't even see it, but as we round the bend again, we see the man standing on the shore, practically on our campsite. He's walking around our bags, like he's patrolling the perimeter of the camp. Not his camp, our camp. Little more than a silhouette, and he has something, not a fishing pole. I was never brave enough to get close to check it out in detail but all three of my friends will tell you he had a rifle. Over his shoulder, from where he got it, we don't know. He should have been able to see us from where he was, but he didn't close in anymore. We decided to play it cool and hide behind the trees. Luckily, Grandma arrives on her kayak shortly after. We call her over to us and tell her everything, but I swear to you, by the time we pointed over to her shoulder to show her the fisherman, he was gone. Like, like a vision. We saw him one more time that night, having a fire. The moonlight on the water illuminated his shape all the way back across the river from where we saw him the first time, fishing in the darkness. We said fuck that guy and went back to making torches. I remember digging my phone out of the waterproof box and trying to send this blurry, creepy picture of the fisherman to my friend as proof. Due to connection, she never got the image, but one text message went through to her to read and it was something like, he's back, he's like a weeping angel or something, coming closer. But only when you look, he goes away out of nowhere. This would have been about seven years ago when I was 16. I was bear hunting with my dad and my brother in the Allegheny National Forest near Tionesta, Pennsylvania. The area we were hunting was one that I had camped in with my family since the time that I could walk. Because of the experience that I had in the woods up there, I was allowed to hunt by myself. I remember it was getting later in the day, just about time to turn back and hike back to camp. There were maybe four inches of snow covering the ground, and judging by the sky, more would fall soon. The light had just started to fade, 
and the heavy foliage as I was slowly hiking along the ridgeline, stopping every few minutes to look and listen. As I was making my way towards camp, I heard a small child's voice off in the distance. Dad! The voice sounded like it belonged to a little boy, and I froze, trying to pinpoint his location. Dad! The voice cried again, this time more frantically. Finally, Dad, help! Then, help, help! My immediate thought was that the boy had been split from his father and was realizing how dark it was starting to get out in the big woods, but he sounded so young, I couldn't imagine how he could have been left alone. The way his voice was whimpering through the silence and stillness of the snowy covered trees still gives me chills when I think about it. It stopped me dead in my tracks and my heart automatically started pounding. I took my rifle off my shoulder and held it in my hand so that it would flail about as I started racing over the snowy terrain towards the voice. I stopped in the clearing to listen again, as his little voice crowded again. Dad, help! I bellowed out. I'm coming for you. Keep yelling. His message didn't change as if to alert me that he had heard me. It was still just, Dad, help. I knew that he was on the lower side of the main road that splits the forest and most likely near a little waterway known as Lamentation Creek. My brother was hunting down there, and I knew he must have been hearing the cries for help as well. I dropped off the snowy hillside almost sliding down until I got into the road. I listened to the voice still crying out as I caught my breath on the roadway. I decided to steep ravine and started racing towards the creek. I thought I must be getting close, so I called out to let him know that I'm coming for him. A few moments go by and no response. I start walking briskly instead of running so I can hear him if he cries out again. Then everything my body said, stop. The hair on my arms, started to rise under my wool shirt, and I froze in place. The darkness was creeping steadily into the enclosed hollow. My senses became fine-tuned. I could hear every snowflake falling into place through the already snow-covered limbs above. My eyes instinctively scanned the expanse searching for movement, color, and light. H hello My voice cracked as I yelled out into the darkening silence. No answer. Again, I yelled off the direction of the small voice, but again, I received no reply. Not from him or any other of the few dozen hunters I had seen earlier that day. My voice carried through the heaviness of the silence, and yet no one replied. I knew damn well my brother had to have heard me, but nothing. That voice inside said stop, now said leave, but I couldn't bring myself to just turn and run. I stood there for another 15 or 20 minutes, calling out to the voice in two minute intervals never hearing a response. I walked through those woods slowly and as alert as I have ever been in my life, constantly checking my six and scanning for signs of life that were never there. When I got back to the camp, I asked my dad and brother if they had heard the small voice and neither of them did. Then I asked if they had heard my voice and again they hadn't. My voice carried an echo through those woods. I know it did and yet they hadn't heard anything. We talked to some guys who were camping close to the creek if they had a small child with them or knew of someone missing a child, and no one had it all. I don't think there ever was a kid now. My husband and I were on a hunting trip deep in the North Woods. Dad pulled the 14-foot trailer out to camp and left us there with the intention that we would be up super early and secure sitting spots on public land. The camp was about 10 miles from the nearest person and 35 miles away from real civilization with street lamps and stuff. Super scenic, it had been snowing and the pine trees are really tall and it was quiet outside. We were just laughing and talking when suddenly something big jumped into the roof. This is northern Michigan in November. There shouldn't be anything big in the woods right now. A bear would be sick or not able to hibernate for some reason and probably will kill you. We stopped mid-sentence and looked up. Right then, it sounded like whatever it was had run along the roof on the trailer and jumped off into the surrounding snow. I needed new pants. My husband starts looking for ammunition for any of the guns that we have with us. And we were both asking each other, what the actual fuck is that? There shouldn't be anything that big in the fucking woods this time of year. We didn't hear anything else after that moment, 
we decided that we absolutely had to see what was going on. We heard no footsteps, but also no rustling or anything else on a clear night with snow on the ground. You'll hear anything close by that's moving. My husband went first, opening the door and peering out. No prints in front of the trailer. We slowly walked around the trailer. Being in a small clearing with only a couple of trees, we could see about 25 feet around the trailer, and after looking around and finding nothing, we just went back inside. Logic said that it was either long gone or something else was going on. It took a while to calm down, but eventually we both fell asleep, loaded guns on the table a few feet away. The next morning, we got up and went outside to look around again, still no tracks other than ours and some rabbits. We were outside looking away from the trailer. We heard this thing again, running right across the trailer towards us. We spun around and faced our attacker and saw some snow falling off the pine tree branches in a line across the aluminum roof. The tree branches didn't even start till 40 feet in the air, so of course, we couldn't have seen them at night since it was just snow. Nothing looked off when we went to investigate the night before. We genuinely thought there was a yeti, bigfoot, or severely pissed off nocturnal mutant deer with a taste for blood, and it turned out to be some freaking snow falling out of a tree and hitting the roof. A year or so back, I did a three month long outdoor expedition in Arizona. We saw plenty of strange things ranging from the Marfa lights while on our way by car to our canoeing section. An old Mexican man trying to sell 15 people, our entire group, hatchets for chocolate, or the calls of elk near our camp. But nothing beats this one strange thing only I saw. We were nearing the end of our three month expedition. It was probably the last two weeks and we started our ISE, individual solo expeditions. We started the trip in the Galerio mountain range as a whole group, but split into four groups of four. My group was the most experienced hikers, so we gave ourselves a 25 to 30 mile loop through three days as the rest did easier 15 to 20 mile sections. The first day was all right with nothing too challenging. The second day, things got weird for our group. We heard footsteps near us, but no one was around. About seven miles into the day, we saw an old abandoned cabin that we used as a marker since it was on our map. We were going to start heading east once we reached it, but we decided to take a break near it. So we placed our bags on the ground and started to tug a snack. About 10 minutes into the break, I needed to pee. So I wandered about 30 feet closer to the cabin and started my business. I could look inside the cabin while I was standing there, so I peeked inside. And I swear to God, I saw a wispy looking man inside the cabin, staring there, looking at me. He was wearing an old, tattered, dirty cotton shirt and brown pants, with a long, white beard. As I saw the man, a chill was sent through my body. I freaked out when I saw him, and quickly finished up and rushed to the others and told them what I saw. None of them believed me, so they joked a bit, but I was quite distraught by this. I told them either go look for yourselves or let's get the fuck out of here, and they realized I wasn't kidding at that point. Mind you, I'm not a huge muscular guy, but to this point in the expedition, we have gotten to know each other quite well, and they knew I wasn't really easily freaked out. I was usually the one to grab a snake and get it out of the camp or other crawling creatures, but they saw how freaked out I was and hightailed it out of there. The rest of the day was fine until the night came around and we all heard the footsteps again. So we all become on edge and pulled out our camp knives and kept them close. Eventually, we fell asleep and nothing else bothered us for the rest of the time. But that freaked me the fuck out and I still have nightmares about this man to this day. Me and three of my friends decided to grab our guns and knives to go camping out in the woods, not far from the city we lived in. We were all 19 and 20 years old and had always been told that Black Panther sightings have happened in the area, which was more than enough motivation for us four guys to grab some beer and guns and head out into the woods. We walked for miles in the dark 
just talking and telling stories, trying to rustle up some wildlife. Then we hear it, like an old woman crying or screeching. It was far off, but it didn't matter. It was terrifying. We had heard stories of what they sound like, and we knew it when we heard it. We also heard some coyotes yelping and obviously finding something to kill because whatever it was was in some serious pain. We noped out of there, and we were going to head back when the wild card of the group says we should still sleep out there, and basically called us everything but pussies if we didn't. So, we did. However, by this time we were over halfway back to the car, but still deep enough in the woods to be totally helpless if something happened. We have like a six person tent that we threw up and we all hop inside after we hung out by the fire for a bit. After we hang inside and talk, we end up falling asleep. Sometime around maybe two or three, I wake up, I hear a noise, and all of us step outside. Little do I know, two of the other guys in the tent have been awoken by the said noise as well. All of us stunned, not knowing what's happened, we are all silent and completely, still as to not wake each other in case that nothing's outside. But the noise and rustling gets louder and closer. The fire has long been out, so there's no light to see. Now, there's something brushing up against the tent and clawing at the opening to the tent. It wasn't zipped, but maybe three-fourths of the way up. Why, I don't know. Then the zipper starts lazily coming down, and we see a silhouette of a man. The three of us scream, and then the figure leaps Superman-style into the tent on top of us, swinging and kicking. We all completely lose it and start beating the shit out of this person before we realize it's our fourth friend, who was just getting out to pee and was having trouble getting back in the tent as he drank a few beers. Campfire was out, and he didn't take his flashlight. He jumped into the tent because we screamed, so he naturally thought he saw someone or something behind him. So he freaked out and tried to get into the safety of the tent. Long story short, we laughed hysterically for at least an hour after that. We didn't know which was more funny, the fact that we were total pansies and got scared to death over our friend taking a piss, or that all three of us were awake at the same time, silently losing our shit without knowing each I grew up on a mountain in the Pacific Northwest, so I spent quite a bit of time exploring local forests and memorizing the trails. As I got older, I wanted to show my friends some of the trails I wandered around as a kid. These places were pretty cool because people long ago had built stuff deep into the woods and forgotten about it, so I knew quite of a few rope swings, tree forts, and ruins of old buildings. I attempted to find a Pacific trail over for a year. It turns out the original entry had long been grown over, so it took a while to find another way to access it. Once I figured out where it was connected, we hiked down the mountain and explored it. This is where it gets weird. As I'm rounding the corner, I notice way deep into the woods, maybe about 200 feet, is a small log cabin. It's definitely nowhere near this trail and seemed out of place. I snapped a few pictures of it. We kept hiking, and I couldn't stop thinking about the cabin. It looked pretty old, but I had never seen it as a kid, and I took those trails as almost every single day during the summer. I went home and immediately shared the pictures with my more adventurous group of friends. I finally convinced them to return to the trail and help me find a way to get to the cabin. A few weeks later, we hiked down the old trail. A group of four people, the cabin, had no main trail across, so we ended up trudging through bushes, dirt, leaves, and across logs. The mountain is really uneven with lots of goalies and dried up stream beds that make it difficult to walk. Finally, we make it to the cabin and instantly, I'm set on edge. As we approach, the first thing I see is ripped up white stuff, later found out it was pieces of a mattress that was covered in blood and dirt. We were walking slowly now, all of us wanting to peek inside the small log cabin but unsure of what we'd find. I convinced our guy friends to go first. The cabin was very simple, with no door and so small you had to duck to enter. Inside were empty cans and food containers laid across the wooden floor along with ripped up clothing. There was a very small bed on the side that had been used quite a bit and was caked in dirt. I peeked inside for about a minute, then I did a 180 and jumped back out, as I quite a bit was freaked out. Even people who squat and live in the woods know you'll bury your waste. 
there was literally a pound of fresh human feces. This was very unsettling. I call everyone to leave and we follow a flatter path back to the trail. The entire day we see pieces of ripped up mattress, more feces and random pieces of what I assume was clothing. When I return home, I decide to look up the cabin online. I figured it might be a historical landmark that squatters had taken over. The weirdest thing is, there was no history, absolutely nothing, no information or pictures of it online. It was like it didn't exist. I've been wanting to go back and explore around it, but now I'm too afraid I'd run into whoever was hanging out, living, or destroying stuff out there. I did a fair share of wild camping when I lived in the UK. Me and my buddy would sleep tentless with bivy bags over the sleeping bag to protect us from the elements. While this was amazing, in general, it would hold mixed results. One hot summer night in Epping Forest, I could feel spiders, bugs, and various creepy crawlies all over my face and barely got any sleep. Tubing back the next day, we had faces like UFC fighters from all the bites. In Buckinghamshire, in a forest near the home of Roald Dahl, we set up camp about 200 meters off the track. While cooking a chili in the dusk, I saw a light far off coming from the track. It was probably someone walking their dog or just looking at their phone as they passed through, but I'm ashamed to say it spooked me to no end and I could barely sleep. But most fitting to this thread is, when hiking and camping in the Forest of Dean, West England, Wales border, the forest from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, mind you, we were aware of the presence of wild boar. Different, I believe, from the ones in the US. Possibly. A lot less dangerous. But big old Bertha's nonetheless. We came across them when hiking, and their size was alarming. We were hiking a path between thick fern and saw a baby boar way ahead. Coming closer, tensely, a massive adult boar crossed the path at great speed where the baby was, and both freaked out and started running. Laughing at our foolishness, after my buddy dropped his iPhone and smashed the screen, we continued our hike with a new respect for the forest inhabitants, and later set up camp deep in the woods. We were sleeping on a hillcock, under deep wooded cover, and in the middle of the night, I was awoken by my friend who informed me there sounded like a boar. Groggy as hell, I could hear commotion and snorting of the animals from all sides. My vision cleared and we could see them even in the near total darkness. It was actually just a large group of them passing the bottom of the hillock and we believed we were surrounded out of fear and naivety. We stood up on a log, standing in our sleeping bags, as if this would do anything, and one of the boar came sniffling close along the ground. Satisfied that it was just stupid humans or else something they couldn't eat, he bounded off and rejoined the collective. There were between 10 to 15 of them, and a load of piglets following. We settled down once again, laughed at our behavior, and went back to sleep unarmed. At the time, it was extremely exhilarating, but in retrospect, a fond memory and learning experience. The next day, driving out of the forest, we could see them in the sides of the thick woods, and once again admired the size of the beasts. I was out camping in a part of Connecticut. Now, I was about 12 and was with a group of other kids ranging from 12 to 17. Think like Boy Scouts. We were in a three-faced cabin arrangement, so any animals could have gotten into our cabin if they were brave enough. It is standard procedure to keep your food bagged up and tied high in branches or in some sort of container so that bears won't get it or smell it. My cabin brought out a lot of candy, as kids do, to stay up really late and play games and stuff but we were saving that for one of the later days. So we locked up all of our airheads, M&Ms, etc. in this kid's large black suitcase, real sturdy. I woke up one night to the sound of a bear coming into our cabin. I was the top bunk, so fortunately, I wasn't as close as I could have been. The bear came in sniffing around. To 12 year old me, it seemed huge. Maybe it was just fear hyperpole, but I thought it could have been a grizzly, probably a black bear though. It finally got to the suitcase. I remember the sort of grunts and snorts it made as it started to tear it apart. It just started scratching and 
occasionally biting it. I just watched as, partly because I was terrified and the other part as I was fascinated. Maybe, if I wasn't so grounded in what was happening, I would have pissed my pants. The bear got to our candy and made off with it. No worries, I went back to sleep with sweat panic drenched sheets. The scariest thing the day after were the gouges the bear made in the wood floor. They were deep rivulets that rain could have easily sat in. It was the closest I've been and hoped to be to an animal of that size. Sometimes. I think videos on YouTube trick us into thinking the camera can be treated like a person, and so therefore, we view animals like that less of primal than they actually are. This happened to myself and a close friend. We're both 23 year old males. This happened just last month. We decided to go on a two night backpacking camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We are both very comfortable with nature and spent a lot of time camping, hunting, fishing, and etc. We hiked about five miles into a small lake and set up camp on a small beach. This was not a heavily trafficked area and we did not expect to run into anyone. Our first night there was just us sitting around the fire. We saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake at around 10.30. This was fairly unusual, however, we did not think too much of it. But as time went on, this flashlight kept moving around the lake, getting closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around the woods in the middle of the night, and we did not particularly want an unwelcomed guess. Once it was clear that the person or people were heading to our campsite, we moved off into the woods nearby to see who wandered up. I took a small axe with me, and he had a 22 rifle. Now, we weren't expecting trouble, and we certainly didn't want any, but we figured we might as well cover our bases. Now, the moment of truth. The flashlight comes near the light of our fire, and it is one man. He has a beard and is probably in his mid-forties. The scary part was, he was carrying what turned out to be a pump-action shotgun. He walked around the campsite a few times, and then proceeded to enter our tent. After rummaging around for a minute or so, he came out and started yelling, I know you're out here, why don't you come say hello? My friend and I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. That is when the man proceeded to fire a shotgun into the woods, not too far from where we were. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing we had, drying off near the fire and threw them in the burn. My friend, who had trained the 22 at the man, asked me if he should shoot. I told him absolutely not, unless he spots us and starts to point the gun in our direction. Thankfully, the man moved off from where he had come out a little while. We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake, ran out, grabbed everything we could fit in the backpack and took off. It was now around 2 or 3 a.m. We ran out the trail with flashlights and made it back to my car as the sun was coming up. We immediately went to the police department and reported it where we also spoke with some forest rangers. That was it. I haven't heard anything back from the police. It wasn't mysterious. However, it creeped the hell out of both of us. In 2007, I was working on a trail crew in the Trinity Alps of Northern California. We had 13 people on the crew and a few support staff. At this point, we'd been in the woods for about two and a half months. We had all seen and heard bears, mountain lions, and pretty much anything that you can think of that would make terrifying noises. After dinner one evening, most of us were sitting around the fire, doing whatever, and all of a sudden, there's a huge, loud, agonizing scream sound. It was unlike anything any of us have ever heard. If I had to describe it, I'd call it a mountain lion shriek combined with the horror of a banshee. Everyone was understandably freaked the hell out. It sounded reasonably close, so a few of us, myself included, decided to investigate. About three miles from our base camp, there was a creature tied to a tree, absolutely losing its mind. It was a fucking llama. At this point, it's 10 p.m. or so and 25 plus miles from the nearest trailhead, and we find this llama tied to a tree just off the trail. We tried to calm it down without much success, and 
went back to camp. The next morning, the llama was gone. It looked like it had broken its restraints and run off. We kept hearing the hormone llama noises from time to time over the few weeks. Towards the end of the season, a group of hunters passed us on the trail. After chatting for a bit, we found out they tied the llama there because it decided to be stubborn and refused to walk anymore. Apparently, it laid down the trail and would not move, so they left it and decided to come back for it. We figured at that point, the llama was probably dead. We hadn't heard any hellacious llama screams for a few months and didn't really think about it however. At the end of the season, when we finally got back to the crew van and we were driving out, that damn llama jumped across the road about 30 yards in front of us. I still think about the demon llama from time to time, and I hope he had a fulfilling life in the Trinities. In college, I spent one month house-sitting a large hunting estate in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. The nearest town was 22 miles away. It was June, 1987. I know it was 87 because it was the baseball season after the Bill Buckner disaster. My girlfriend's parents owned the place. It was in southeastern Idaho. I'm not going to say what town it was 22 miles from because they might still own it and I don't want this to get any more weirder than it already has. It was a pretty big place with a lot of acreage. The guy who was full-time caretaker for the place had just quit. My girlfriend's dad went out there to find a new caretaker, but the new caretaker couldn't start for one month. Her dad offered me to pay $1,200 to go out there, free food, satellite TV, and free booze. All I had to do was keep an eye on the place and feed the dogs and the horse. I had never, ever been out west, so I took him up on it. It sounded better than doing landscape. I spent the time reading and exploring, playing with dogs, riding the horses, and shooting. Completely uneventful experience, until that night. That night, after the knocking stopped and the dog stopped barking, I eventually went back to sleep. I didn't freak out at all that much because there were two German Shepherds inside with me and I had a gun. I kept it on the nightstand. I had been drinking a little, but not drunk by any means. There were several neighbors that were a few miles away. I was kind of thinking someone just simply drove up the wrong way. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of someone knocking loud and hard on the front door and the dogs were going nuts. There was no way I was going to answer it. I just grabbed the gun and kept quiet upstairs. The next morning at the crack of dawn, I opened the front door to let the dogs out and see a white Chevy Nova sitting in the driveway. It was near the small cabin for the caretaker. The cabin was 100 yards from the main house. I called my girlfriend's dad and asked him if he knew anyone that had that maker model of a car and told him about what happened the night before. He didn't know anyone and he called the police directly. The police show up and ask me a few questions and walk around the property for about an hour or so. The car was locked and the police had it towed. I have no idea if it was broke down or not. There was only one set of tire tracks coming into the house. A few days later, my girlfriend's dad called me up and told me that the guy who owned the car was missing and to call the police if anything weird happened again. I have no idea who the guy was at all. I don't know how long he was missing or, or when he was reported missing, or who reported him missing. He was just missing. My girlfriend's dad didn't know that much. After one month, I go back home and my girlfriend and I break up shortly thereafter. I see her out on the town several months later and I ask her if she ever found out what happened to that guy. All she knows is the guy was found dead by suicide 30 miles away. The suicide happened several months after that incident, and he was found a couple days after he had killed himself. I asked her how he did it, and where he was found, who found him, etc, etc, and I got nothing. I never saw her again. You all know just as much as I know, and I feel your pain. In college, I spent one month house-sitting a large hunting estate in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. The nearest town was 22 miles away. It was June, 1987. I know it was 87 because it was the baseball season after the Bill Buckner disaster. My girlfriend's parents owned the place. It was in southeastern Idaho. I'm not going to say what town it was 22 miles from because they might still own it and I don't want this to get any more weirder than it already has. 
It was a pretty big place with a lot of acreage. The guy who was full-time caretaker for the place had just quit. My girlfriend's dad went out there to find a new caretaker, but the new caretaker couldn't start for one month. Her dad offered me to pay $1,200 to go out there, free food, satellite TV, and free booze. All I had to do was keep an eye on the place and feed the dogs and the horse. I had never, ever been out west, so I took him up on it. It sounded better than doing landscape. I spent the time reading and exploring, playing with dogs, riding the horses, and shooting. Completely uneventful experience, until that night. That night, after the knocking stopped and the dog stopped barking, I eventually went back to sleep. I didn't freak out at all that much because there were two German Shepherds inside with me and I had a gun. I kept it on the nightstand. I had been drinking a little, but not drunk by any means. There were several neighbors that were a few miles away. I was kind of thinking someone just simply drove up the wrong way. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of someone knocking loud and hard on the front door and the dogs were going nuts. There was no way I was going to answer it. I just grabbed the gun and kept quiet upstairs. The next morning at the crack of dawn, I opened the front door to let the dogs out and see a white Chevy Nova sitting in the driveway. It was near the small cabin for the caretaker. The cabin was 100 yards from the main house. I called my girlfriend's dad and asked him if he knew anyone that had that maker model of a car and told him about what happened the night before. He didn't know anyone and he called the police directly. The police show up and ask me a few questions and walk around the property for about an hour or so. The car was locked and the police had it towed. I have no idea if it was broke down or not. There was only one set of tire tracks coming into the house. A few days later, my girlfriend's dad called me up and told me that the guy who owned the car was missing and to call the police if anything weird happened again. I have no idea who the guy was at all. I don't know how long he was missing or, or when he was reported missing or who reported him missing. He was just missing. My girlfriend's dad didn't know that much. After one month, I go back home, and my girlfriend and I break up shortly thereafter. I see her out on the town several months later, and I ask her if she ever found out what happened to that guy. All she knows is the guy was found dead by suicide 30 miles away. The suicide happened several months after that incident, and he was found a couple days after he had killed himself. I asked her how he did it, and where he was found, who found him, etc, etc, and I got nothing. I never saw her again. You all know just as much as I know, and I feel your pain. This happened to my grandfather and I in El Salvador. When I was eight years old on a Saturday night, we were coming back from visiting relatives who lived up in the mountain from us, about an hour and a half or a two hour hike. During the day, it's a beautiful hiking place, but at night, it is quite scary. We ended up leaving my uncle's place later than we thought, at about 8 p.m., but we were not worried since we had done this hike hundreds of times, at all times of the day, but never after 10 p.m. According to locals, it's not safe to be out there after 10 p.m. because of weird things that they have seen and heard. Thankfully, we were prepared for nightfall. We had our own flashlight, Grandpa had a huge flashlight that was bright with a headlight on our car and our backpack had bottles of waters and snacks. Well halfway into our way back home, it was pretty scary. There was no moonlight, so it was really dark, and only trees all around, and a few homes here and there. We heard noises and other weird things, but since we were in the middle of mountains, we dismissed it and kept on walking. About a mile away from home, things got very weird and spooky. We couldn't even hear a cricket sound, everything just went silent. At this point, my grandfather grabbed my hand and told me to stay close. I remember getting scared and worried. I looked at my watch and it was 9.15pm. I told my grandpa and he said not to worry, we were almost home. I kept pointing my flashlight in front of me so I wouldn't step on something or trip. Then about 20 feet from us was this huge tree and it had a bow in it, which I thought was strange and so did my grandfather. He replied with, well, that's interesting, a bow on a tree. Then, to our surprise, a woman wearing a gray or a light blue dress, I don't really remember, was standing on the other side of the tree with her back to us. I told my grandpa, why would she be out here at this time, by herself? 
he said. She, maybe she's lost or hurt. So we, we hurried to see if she needed help. We were about ten feet away from her when she started walking. So Grandpa yells, Hey, excuse me, miss, are you okay? Are you lost? With no answer, do you need help? Again, no answer. She just kept walking. After you pass the tree with the bow, about five to ten feet, you go down the hill into an open space with a few trees. And there are some pretty flowers there, with a walking trail next to it. Standing on the bottom of the hill in front of the trail, Grandpa turned and said, Come on, honey, we gotta hurry. I don't think she's okay. And when we turned back, she disappeared. We could not find her anywhere. We looked everywhere and had no luck. There was no way she could have run that fast, and the trail was pretty long, with little trees scattered around. So, nowhere to hide, even if you wanted to. Since Grandpa had a big flashlight, we all had a pretty good view of the landscape, all around us, and we saw nothing. We kept walking, and still looking, hoping to find her, but we had no luck. Once we reached the town, I looked at my watch and it was 10.15pm. I told Grandpa how happy I was that we had made it safe and just in time to get out of the mountains, yet still worried about what happened to that lady. The next day, Grandpa told a neighbor of our incident with a strange woman, and he interrupted my grandfather and said, Are you talking about the big tree right before you go down the hill? Grandpa said, Yes, why? Our neighbor called his wife Susan over and began to tell us about a murder that happened in that area. On Thursday of that week, a lady was walking home around 8 p.m. or so, when she came across a man who tried to rob her, and since she fought back, he stabbed her four times and she bled to death. She was found in the bottom of the hill the next morning. The killer was caught the next day drunk with a bloody shirt and hands with a knife in his pocket. People thought he was hurt, but when they heard the murder, they turned in him, and he did confess. My grandfather turned white, and I didn't know what to say but we felt so bad for her. The neighbor's wife, Susan, said that we were not the only ones that have seen her. A few locals have seen her walk from the tree to the bottom of the hill where her spirit was always back and forth. The bow on the tree was put there on her behalf. Camping in Wyoming, two hours from pretty much anywhere with my dad, my friend, and my dog, this dog was the calmest, albeit quite stupid, and nicest dog I've ever had. I've never heard her growl or bark at anything, no matter how much it presented a threat to us or her. She just assumed everything was friend or food. It's late at night, my dad's asleep, and my friend and I are just hanging around the campfire. Out of nowhere, the dog bolts up, bark once, and starts growling in the direction of the field next to our site. Of course we're freaking out trying to figure out what the hell is going on, and what she's on about. When we realized, there's a group of shadows on the other side of the field. We just sit there, staring at whatever it was. When we hear a conversation, no clue what language it was in. This goes on for about ten minutes of us staring wide-eyed at the shadows. I didn't think to wake my dad for whatever reason. When the shadows just went away and my dog stops growling, it lays down and falls back asleep. That was the only time that she ever did anything like that in over a decade that we had her. It still freaks me out to this day. This past winter, I hiked on one of the high peaks of the ADKs with a buddy of mine and camped out overnight. Everything was fine the entire first day when we were there. I had great night's sleep and woke up early to hike back to the parking area. On my way back to the trail, my friend and I noticed that someone else had been hiking as well. About a mile after walking, I stopped and saw that my full name, first and last, was drawn into the snow on the side of the footpath. I didn't do it and neither did my friend. It was snowing a bit throughout the night and if it was drawn the day before, the snow would have covered it up. We got a bit freaked out and decided to hustle back to our car so we could get out of there. We finally get back to the parking area and I go to sign myself out of the registry book. When I turn the page to where I signed in, I see that someone scribbled out all my information to where you couldn't read it anymore. No one else has signed into the book besides myself for three days. I will not be going back there.
Last year, I was with a buddy of mine and we were going to do the Heart Creek Scramble in Alberta. But due to some health conditions he has, it was going to be strenuous to complete and we figured we'd make it easy and just do the simple trail. Now, we're both climbers and have been to Heart Creek for rock climbing in the past and had a great time. So it wasn't a surprise to see the sporadic climbers on the mountainside as we went. Heart Creek is also pretty popular and easy for people who just want to go for a nice nature walk and maybe have picnics. Anyway, we walked in, enjoying the day watching climbers on our way by. We saw a couple even doing some multi-pitch climbing, which means basically leapfrogging up the route. We settled in for lunch about a half hour later and left a couple of hours after that. On our way back, I remember seeing a climbing shoe in the creek and thinking, oh, someone must have lost this. I picked it up when my buddy got my attention and I looked further downstream. Both climbers, a young man, 29 or so, I learned later, and his partner were both lying in the creek bed, rope and harnesses still attached, dead. It was very surreal. We had just seen these people climbing not two hours before, making their calls and having a good time. The first reaction I had was that I remembered that there was a family right behind us, a husband, a wife, and a young daughter who were playing in the creek on the way down. We ran back and stopped them and explained as quietly as we could what was ahead and before we knew it, Looky Loos had come by. It turned out that the husband was an off-duty RNCP officer, so he took control of the situation. I learned later we weren't the first ones on the scene that the authorities had been called out. It was a very quiet ride back into town. More details. So, the couple were climbing, and they were both experienced enough, but one was still learning. They attempted to do a dual lowering maneuver, using each other's weight and feeding the rope through the barelays. One of them made a mistake and lost their end of the rope, and that was it for both of them. There wasn't a lot of blood, strangely, and they looked very peaceful. I didn't get a good look at the girl. I mostly only saw the guy there. The story ran for a couple of days in the area, talking about the male as the family of the girl didn't want to disclose anything. That was not something I thought I'd see that day for sure. I was once canoeing the boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada. These aren't your normal backyard ponds. The boundary waters are thousands of enormous lakes interconnected with each other. Think many great lakes. We had been canoeing and camping along the lakes for about a week at this point. We didn't really have an itinerary, just planned to boat and camp, fish, and live off the land for two weeks. We had a GPS and an SAT phone to call a helicopter for pickup whenever we were done. Anyway, about a week in, we were set to canoe a few hours to the next lake. An hour or so in, we are in the center of an extremely long and narrow lake. Unfortunately, a storm started to blow in and the waves on the lake of the center started to swell to two plus feet. Too much for our dinky canoes. We pulled off to a random clearing on the shore and set up camp in a rush to avoid being totally thrashed by a rainstorm. We just set up camp and hunkered down for the night. By the next morning, it had cleared up. We started walking up the coast of the lake about 200 feet from our camp looking for a good fishing spot. What we actually found was another campsite. However, it was absolutely wrecked. Trash was strewn everywhere, tents collapsed and torn, clothes on the ground. At first, we were just like disgusted, like what assholes would do this, who would leave their shit out for bear food. The more we looked around though, the weirder things seemed. For one, their garbage was still hoisted into a tree to keep it safe from bears, but the whole bag was ripped open despite being 30 feet in the air. Second, literally everything except the canoes were still at the campsite. Clothes, packs, food, rope, pans, like a serious set of hiking equipment, enough for two to three people. Half of it was trashed and torn open, mostly the packs, tent, and clothes. Their long johns, ditching hundreds of dollars of gear in the process. It's like somebody just noped the hell out of there. 
We waited a couple hours and eventually called it back to our helicopter crew, but they hadn't been aware of anybody else getting any distress calls. We eventually just left and moved camp. Everybody was pretty upset by it and a day or two later we ended up the whole trip early because it just seemed like nobody wanted to be out there anymore. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. First thought was a bear attack, but there was food left uneaten, and I've heard bears are way too easy to scare away. I've seen bear attacks on camps before, and it was nothing like this. Bears rip open packs and go after food, and they're generally pretty easy to scare. What still sticks with me is why all of their clothes and packs were still there, with half being totally destroyed and half being untouched. I still don't get it. I've done a lot of other camping, hiking, rafting, and biking all around the country, and I've never had any other weird experiences like that. I was camping and hiking in the Ofenoki Swamp. Me and my girlfriend were far from being the only ones there, but when we woke up in the morning, we took out a canoe out into the swamp to explore. It was early. There was a thick layer of fog resting just atop the water. The whole swamp was completely still. No animals inside at all. We paddled down the waterway for a while and saw nothing else. Not a single person. Not a bird. Not anything. We didn't hear a single sound. We had just cornered a bend in the swamp and we hear it. The loudest, guttural bellow I have ever heard in my life. I could feel it echo through my chest. A true dinosaur sound. We stopped paddling and looked around for a while, and we looked at each other creeped out. We knew it was an alligator, but we had never heard one that loud. We both looked behind the canoe behind us, and the backs and eyes of at least 20 alligators had risen. They had just surfaced out of nowhere. We slowly started to paddle forward, and we hear more bellows. They come from all around us in front, behind, to the sides, and as sounds are emanating from the bush-covered banks. Each glance behind us, we saw more eyes appear, more scaled mounds breaking the water's surface. From the banks, huge reptiles broke the water all around us. We looked back again as we paddled faster, easily 40 alligators behind us now, and we began to see them appear in front of us. 10 to 15 huge lizards seemingly blocking our path. Then, one of the largest alligators I've ever seen surfaces right where my paddle was going down. I hit the beast on the back of the head, and the thrash he made was incredible. When this massive head hit the side of the small canoe, I thought we were going into the water. Water came into the canoe, and the side dipped down. The beast disappeared below the boat, and we held steady. We paddled forward as we could right into the dotted landscape of scales and eyes. Behind us, the same guttural war echoed through my body. As we cut through the field of eyes and backs, we started to see the path clearer. The huge monster that had almost cast eyes bellowed one more time. We turned as we made it past the last of the animals, and we could see the monster staring at us, watching us leave. All of the other alligators began to sink to the water's floor. The big guy stayed there watching us until he was satisfied we had gone, I guess. Then he disappeared without a sound, back into the black, murky depths of the swamp. We banked the canoe further up the waterway, got out and just sat for a while, trying to take in what we had just experienced. Alright, so here it goes. This is the story of something I experienced which I cannot explain. What I am about to describe happened over a year ago, but a close friend of mine has convinced me to finally put it out there for others to ponder. Maybe someone can help me make sense of it. The friend and my wife are the only two people that know about this up until now. I would like to make sense of it, but it's not something I can just talk about to people. Let's start with a little background before you ask. What the heck are you doing in the middle of Death Valley alone anyway? I have two professions. I'm an army officer, and I'm an adventurer. I do outdoor stuff, often as a way to recharge and refocus. 
because leadership does not come naturally to me as an introvert. Being in crowds is bad enough. Organizing, training, and leading crowds using every last drop of charisma is something else entirely. That's why I get away as much as possible. I seek out places of beauty and solitude, which allow me to rest internally, even if it requires physical exertion to get there. If you're heavily introverted like I am, you know what I'm talking about. So, in the summer of 2015, I had just returned from Africa, where I was on orders. I was drained. I had to get away. I quickly planned a trip through Death Valley. I would take my street-legal dirt bike 1,500 miles over several days through the hottest place on Earth during the hottest time of the year just because I knew it would be the most peaceful and relaxing place I could access. Now, I did mention that I consider adventuring a profession of mine. That's because I've spent countless hours adventuring, exploring, and just escaping. I consider myself highly skilled at it, and it is also a paid occupation for me, because I document most of it through monetized channels. Which, that being said, I have seen some unusual, disturbing, and just plain cool things while I'm out there. Especially in the desert. Scavengers that will stalk you for miles hoping you would drop dead and become a meal. Caves which appear to be man-made. Hundreds of miles from anything. Traps set to immobilize vehicles or people. Old military equipment. You just see a lot of stuff when you're out there. Generally, it all makes sense, though. On this adventure, though, in Death Valley, however, I saw something that just didn't make sense. I had been riding all day through Death Valley. It was a very hot, easily over 120 degrees, and there were very few people out there that day. In fact, I hadn't seen anybody for about half of that day since heading toward Uhebi Crater. But I did see one couple in a Mustang, just leaving Uhebi Crater when I got there. That was it. It's not surprising though, because of how hot it was and because of how our Uhebi Crater is. I headed toward Racetrack Playa and stopped somewhere between Uhebi Crater and Racetrack Playa for the night. This is a very far from anything and only accessible by gravel road on one end and unmaintained. It's a harsh trail on the other end. There was nobody out there for obvious reasons. I unpacked my sleeping stuff and had a meal before the sun went down. I took all of my camera batteries out and hooked them up for charge for the night. I also turned my phone off and put it on the charger as well. I left all the stuff by the bike, which was just off the road. I set up my sleeping bag a distance away from the bike and the trail. I wasn't expecting anyone to come by at all, but it was just part of my tactical plan in case of a random bad guy stumbling upon my area. My bright red bike would obviously draw all the attention, and my camouflage sleeping bag would go undetected, allowing me some time and freedom to maneuver on the bad guys. I got in my sleeping bag, bringing only the camel back, my folding knife, and my red light tactical flashlight. Everything else was at the bike. It was very peaceful. It was almost silent out there. It was warm and felt really safe and was pretty easy to sleep. However, when you're on your own, you never sleep very deeply. Your mind stays alert and ready that the little things wake you. That night, there was really nothing to wake me. It was nice until about 2 a.m. That's when the event happened. I woke up to the sounds of children. Yes, children. In the middle of freaking nowhere. Here I am being woken up by children talking. It was fully enclosed in my sleeping bag, so for a moment I just stayed still trying to figure out what the heck I was hearing. It kept going, the undeniable sound of children talking to each other. I couldn't make out what they were saying. It sounded like it was 50 meters off or so. I caught out. Hello? Still in my sleeping bag. It stopped, just for a moment, but continued. Now, I knew for sure there had to be kids there, in the middle of nowhere. I sat up peeking out of my sleeping bag and turned my flashlight on. I scanned the direction of the noises, which was the opposite direction of the trail on my bike. There they were. Two kids, 50 to 75 meters out or so, opposite direction of the trail in the middle of nowhere. They were walking, kind of wandering, looking lost and sounding lost. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but it had a tone of discussion like they were deliberating to figure out what to do or where to go. I called out again, louder this time. Hello. They stopped, 
They looked in my direction, but they were looking past me. In my direction, but not at me. Like they heard me, but I wasn't even there. I was illuminating them in a very bright flashlight. They should have been covering their faces, but they were just scanning. Like they were looking for me and just didn't see me. They turned back, kept walking, and I just watched them, not sure what to do. Their noises and their images faded into the distance. I just sat there. I didn't know what to think or what to do. It was just so bizarre. After a while, I laid back down and just relaxed until it started raining at about 5.30 a.m. That's when I packed up in the darkness and continued with my adventuring into the morning. So that's what I saw. I saw children in Death Valley, over a hundred miles from freaking anything, just walking, talking and wandering, and then vanishing. Oddly enough, it didn't freak me at the moment. I was more confused than anything. That's why I couldn't make a decision on what to do in that moment. Now, looking back, it's freaky. I started my career working in sawmills back in 2007. I was hired for a portable sawmill in southwest Washington state. This mill was located quite literally in the middle of the forest. It was constructed in the early 70s and even in the short 30 years of its life, it seemed to have a decent amount of history inside of it. I worked the weekend graveyard shift, 2.30 to 4.30, the following day on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. I was a trim drop operator. I had a partner who I worked with and we were the only two in the area. His name is Pete. We would take turns rotating through the night. One of us would run the drop, where you drop the bad boards, chunks of garbage, and just about anything else that can't be turned into quality lumber. The boards that would be left to be processed would enter a lugged, chain system and then be pulled through a scanner, and then a trim box that would cut the lumber to length and then take them to the next area, which was the sorter. The other of us would sit at the operator's console about 20 feet away and watch monitors that displayed the various parts of the machine and process flow. We rotate every few thousand boards to keep from being fatigued. One night, I was running the drop, and Pete was kicked back at the console station, reading away at the newspaper. Everything was going just as normal as ever, when I glanced over and noticed him peering up at the monitor for the outfeed with a puzzled look on his face. He jumped up and went walking down to the trimmer saw box and looked around it. He then walked back looking quite concerned, sat down and shrugged and started reading again. This happened a second time, but by now, it had my attention. I threw up the skids to stop the flow of lumber, and walked over to him and asked him what was up. There was a guy, standing at the outfeed. I went down there to see what the hell was going on, and when I got over there he was gone, he said, with a confused look on his face. This didn't make sense, because this was an area that wasn't accessible unless you stop the machine and activate a catwalk that unfolds from the outfeed of the saw box to allow access to a small platform on the opposite side of the machine. I asked him to point out where this guy was hanging out. Pete pointed to the platform, slightly frustrated. I shook my head at him and laughed before running back to the drop to continue running lumber. Pete stayed fixed on the monitors now, newspaper folded up and thrown to the side. Not but five minutes later go by before he jumps up and runs around the saw fail. This is the time that I threw the skids up and followed him. By the time I got there, there was nothing. He pointed across the lumber table, which was 30 feet wide, to the platform across the machine and yells, Who's over there? We weren't allowed to be over here, God damn it! Both of us waited to see the man he had seen on the monitor, but once again, there was nothing. After a minute or so of looking on, we decided to move back to our stations. I walked to the console station, glancing at the monitor, seeing nothing and Pete followed shortly behind. By the time I made it to the drop to start again, Pete howled. I snapped around and saw him stabbing the monitor with his finger, yelling for me to come back. I ran over and looked at the monitor. Sure enough, there was a guy. He was standing on the small platform Pete pounded out. The monitor was small, grainy and black and white, but we are able to work out that this guy is wearing a tin hard hat, a very dirty and worn button-up long sleeve, with the sleeves either rolled up or ripped off, and Everything was dirty, with these very thick denim jeans of a dark color. He was just standing there, with his elbows on the handrail looking at the lumber from the saw box. Wait here, Pete yelled as he stealthily snuck down to the outfeed once again. 
as he closed in on the outfeed area to catch this guy red handed for being in the area you can't be or shouldn't access while in operation. I looked back and forth at Pete and the monitor about the time Pete made it to the saw box. The man on the corner looked up into the camera and literally just faded away. I completely lost my shit. I felt a cold chill run down my back accompanied by all the hairs on my arm standing up. I sprinted as quickly as I could to Pete, exclaiming, that ain't a guy. It wasn't a fucking guy. Pete just stood there dumbfounded, both of us now looking at the platform with our own eyes. What should we do? I asked, quite dumbfounded and disturbed now. Pete crossed his arms and thought, before deciding we should call our foreman down to tell him the story. We walked back to the operator station and Pete grabbed the mic on the radio and called for the foreman. We ran up until he arrived, both of us ready to bolt for the saw box in case we saw the entity again. The foreman showed up after about five minutes, and we stopped running and explained what had happened. The foreman didn't look impressed, but he was smiling. He explained that we had just seen one of our old timers. Back in the late 70s, we had a man who worked here, who ran the chip bin station, and one day, arrogance got the best of him. Long story short, he got buried in a chip pile and was crushed and suffocated before he could dig himself out. The foreman said he was one of the only people to ever work here and wear a tin hard hat, as homage to his previous career as a logger in the woods. Other operators have had occurrences where they've witnessed this entity wandering around different machines, seeming just to watch the flow of lumber. This story happened about two years ago, and I still occasionally think about it. I live in the middle of Scotland. The winters are wet, cold, and immensely dark. One night, I was walking up to the shops at about 10pm. The path followed an area of interlocking, run-down terraces, encroaching forests, whose branches reached out across the path in several fields. With it being winter, the grass came up to your thigh. This journey, in total, usually takes about 30 minutes at least. On the right side of the latter area of the paths is a series of mansions, about 5 or 6 of them all along this stretch. Most of the occupants would have been away for the winter, but one mansion was well lit. This mansion was just like the others, a posh estate building which was well kept as they usually are apart from the specifically placed ivy. It was a completely normal mansion. All the lights in the house were turned on, and in the windows I saw the shadows of dozens of people prancing around, dancing, having fun and drinking. Strange thing was though, I couldn't hear anything. No voices, laughter, or music. Nothing at all. In all honesty, it looked like a fun party that I somehow felt I was allowed to go in with no problem. But I don't party with strangers and I carried on to the shops and got what I needed. When I left the shops, it had started snowing. The clouds covered so much of the sky that not even the light of the moon shone through. The snow was barreling down so much that I could barely see, but I kept going back down the path towards home. I decided to have another look at the park of the mansion, just out of curiosity. To my surprise, all I saw was nothing. The previously lively and decadent and gorgeous mansion was now a decaying relic. Its sides crumbling, its windows smashed, its roof caved in. The trimmed garden was now an overgrown jungle. Between me and walking back to my house had completely changed. I quickly walked home after seeing that. A year after that, me and a friend went to have a look at the house in the middle of a summer day. We didn't break into the house and all of the doors were covered with metal locks. During one day, the house was kind of beautiful, like a little overgrown, isolated paradise with many kinds of beautiful and colorful flowers dotting around the area. All that we found was a shed, which inside was an abandoned workshop and a business car dated in 1996. I don't know what to think of the house. Did I imagine it? Was it squatters? In Scotland, there are so many stories of fairies creating visual illusions to lure humans to their world, which could explain the lack of sound. In all honesty, I don't know. I still walk past that mansion whenever I go to the shops. 
It's been gated up now and entirely covered in locks. Whatever mystery can be answered by going into the mansion itself, I'm not going to go look. I hope you like my story, Swamp. It's been puzzling me for years. I was 10 or 11 years old when I got on a camping trip with my dad's friend Bujo and his wife and kids. We had been friends for a while, so we considered each other family. We were camping up in Granbury. I think it was Sunset Point Campgrounds, but I don't really remember the name. Anyway, one night my dad was telling cheesy campfire scary stories. I had started to black out when I heard he mention Red Eyes. Apparently the story was connected to the campgrounds, but before he had started it, cause me and my cousin Jade had already heard it before, my aunt and uncle put us out of earshot and told us we would take their headlamps that had an infrared setting on them and scare the living crap out of the boys. So we lied and said we'd go into the bathroom and went up to the camp spot above the one everyone was at and waited until my dad had gotten to a good part to scare my little cousins and brother. We turned on the infrared lights and then started to call their names out one by one until finally little Bujo got so scared he jumped out of his chair and pushed my brother and his younger brother Noah out of the way and he dashed from his chair to the camper to the mattress in seconds leaving Noah and my brother in the dust. Everyone sat in their chairs, laughing their heads off. Soon, everyone called it a night, while me and Jade were in the spare room of my camper, messing around. It was midnight and we were watching movies on my laptop, when Jade had to go to the bathroom for real. I went with her because, to be honest, I was scared of being alone. I was standing outside the bathroom, when somewhere in the thick spread of trees, I heard a stick snap in half. I had thought it was just an animal, but then I noticed footsteps coming towards me, so I pointed my flashlight in the direction of about 3 or 4 trees, and saw a guy's head poking out from behind a tree. The guy looked like he was in his mid-40s, but there was something off about him. I quickly turned my flashlight off for 10 seconds, and then turned it back on, and when I looked back at the trees, he wasn't there, but instead, behind the tree in front of me. I panicked and banged on the bathroom wall and yelled to Jade, Jade, hurry up! There was no reply. Jade! Still no reply. By this time, he wasn't hiding behind the tree anymore. Instead, he was standing at the edge of the tree line, just staring at me with lifeless eyes. I once again banged on the wall and yelled at Jade, Hurry up! The man started to inch closer and closer while I was backing up. Being the only paranoid person in my family, I had my pocket knife and pulled it out. After thinking I'd run away, Jade finally came out, but was confused why I had the look of terror plastered on my face, until she herself saw the man. This time, when Jade came into his view, he smirked and broke into a run towards us. We had gotten a good distance away from him, when some people that were still apparently up asked what we were running from, so we explained everything. They then called the park rangers and told them everything, and then the rangers walked back up to our campsite. The very next morning, they found the guy wandering around other people's campsites, stealing food from bear-proof boxes or whatever. I never really knew why he had chased us, or what he was doing at the time, but I never went to the bathroom without my mum or dad. I've got a good one for you, but I start this story. Let me give you a little insight on myself. I grew up a very military strict family. From the moment I turned five, my dad taught me everything I know now. From fighting to survival skills. My dad being an ex-Navy SEAL, nothing really scares me. I'm not trying to paint myself as the most fearless person in the world, but I'm also a paranormal investigator. Not something I talk about at work, but after having my fair share of experiences, I grew to love it, and it's always interested me. So from putting away some of the worst people in the world and my fair share of seeing the creepiest shit, nothing honestly scares me. This story takes place several summers ago. Two of my friends, Craig and Justin. Justin also being in law enforcement, and the other friend, a firefighter, decided to go camping. I always felt so comfortable in the woods. As I said, my dad taught me everything I know. We would just spend days in the woods, just living off the land. My friend knew of very remote areas up in New Hampshire. I don't recall the location. I was actually excited because I hadn't been camping in years. It took us some time to finally find a good spot to get a good idea of the area. I felt like we were on another planet. We set up our tents, gathered up some firewood. All of us had brought MREs, ate, 
sat around talking for what felt like hours. We all were pretty tired and decided to head to bed. I settled into my tent and quickly passed out. I was awoken up at maybe around 3 a.m. to this horrible feeling. The only way to explain it is the need to fight or flight. Now, I was always carrying a gun on me, my Beretta 92. It never really leaves my side. I sat up and looked around my tent. It was small enough that there wasn't much space. Here is the creepy part. I remember my father used to tell me to listen to the woods, the animals, and night crawlers, and they will tell you something is wrong. You won't hear them, and that's it. I heard it nothing. For the first time in my life, I felt fear. I have had my fair share of demonic hauntings, and that doesn't come close to this. I peered out of the tent. We had set the tent up on a good elevation facing an open field, about 100 yards or so. Mind you, it was a full moon and bright as heck. Something was standing there. I can only begin to describe this thing as a mammal half-lizard thing. The best way I can describe it is that it looked like it had a body of a horse, and it looked like it had a lizard-like face, and what I can only describe as spikes coming out of its back, and one hell of a set of teeth. At first, I seriously thought someone was in a costume messing with us, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was getting from this thing, an unearthly one. I did notice it looked like something. I couldn't make out what kind of animal it was, but it was probably the size of a raccoon. It looked like it was trying to sneak by it, but the animal just randomly, I recall accepting to its doom, fell on its side and just let the thing take it. I was absolutely terrified. I knew if this thing headed our way, no 9mm was going to do anything to this. I could even hear it breathing all the way from my tent. What only sounds like something breathing through putting. I crawled through my friend's tent, keeping a low profile. In a small relief, I noticed my friend Craig was also looking at the same thing. We waited as this thing just stood there, looking around. Then it started to make its way for the tree lines. We could hear it smashing through the trees, and then silence. Craig and I just laid there for what felt like hours, and the sun came up, still absolutely terrified to move. Justin woke up, of course, heard nothing, and not believing a single word we said, we packed up that day, and I have never been back to those woods. I seriously was afraid to tell the story. I'm probably going to be sent for a psych evaluation, and I don't care because I'm not making this crap up. I have several stories, but I'm only going to do the ones that stand out the most. They're all dealing with what I personally believe is a raven mocker. I believe that because I'm a Shiroki. It's a shapeshifter, and it's only been seen once in almost a decade worth of encounters. At least in human form anyway. There isn't much information on them, but I know they're usually invisible, and I've been told they can take many forms. The first three stories all occurred while I was outside, near wooded areas after dark. For some reason, it likes to stay in the woods. I was a dream attacks, and a few are extremely unusual animal encounters. These all take place starting from when I was maybe 11 or so, and continue on up to today. I'm 22 now. I apologise in advance if it's long. I try to include as much detail as possible. The first one happened at my grandmother's house. Me, my oldest cousin Tristan, had decided to go outside after everyone else had gone to bed. We were out in the shed, talking and smoking cigarettes, when I heard my grandmother call my name. I freaked out because I thought we were busted. Got even more freaked out because it sounded like it came from behind the shed and we knew she was in the house, which was in front of us. Now to finish the story, I have to tell you that my cousin is a hillbilly from up around Black Mountain that was really into instigating things. I'm an Indian, and I was raised by old Indian folk. I knew there were some things you should fear and respect, but mostly fear. So anyway, he wants to check it out. Peer pressure is a hell of a drug. So we went to look. We walked up towards the tree line, and out of nowhere, I heard one of my other cousins call me from ahead of us in a thick patch of cane, on the swampy side of the woods. Then, my dad called me, followed shortly by my aunt, both of whom we knew were nowhere in the general vicinity of that house. This thing had literally mimicked a nice percentage of my family at this point, and I have crept up to within 5 feet of that patch of cane, and I'm still edging forward. 
Now there's a tree just behind the bushes, and up about 15 feet, there's a branch. That branch starts striking, and I heard leaves rattle. When I looked up, I saw something falling from the branch. It almost looked like a large bird, but I didn't really get a good look at it. As soon as it landed, it sounded like something started running ahead of us through those bushes. If I had not experienced the events that happened up to this point, I'd have thought it was a bear charging towards us. It's the only logical answer. If you looked across the top of the cane, you could see the taller ones passing. This thing was big, fast, and really heavy. It looked like it was going to make one hell of an entrance, with sounds to the match. The footsteps sounded heavy enough to be mistaken for a horse, but my ear said it was running upright on two legs. Right before it got to the edge, it just stopped. We were too shook up to even move. We just stood there. When I finally regained my mobility, I walked backwards all the way to the house. I didn't take my eyes off the tree line once. We got inside and as soon as we closed the door, something hit it. Tristan opened it up to look and there was nothing, so he closed it and locked it. We turned around and started to walk away and it happened again. It hit harder this time. We looked at each other and went straight into the living room. We sat there in the darkness and didn't move or say a word until the sun came up. This second story happened at my house in my backyard. My buddy Fernando was staying over this particular night. I and Fernando had set up a tent and were planning on camping outside that night. We were in the house getting something to drink and I started to head back outside while Fernando was playing outside in the fridge. So we had this really weird cat at the time and just showed up out of nowhere. He would show up and creep around the edge of the woods and just watch me all the time. Sometimes he would glare at me at night while literally peeking around a tree. All you could see was a cat shaped black outline with two eyes that glowed a bluish green colour when the light hit them. It was unnerving. Occasionally it would make these really unusual sounds that were kind of cat like and not very cat like at the same time. Almost like a cat was mixing a completely unnatural sound with a different animal. It only did the weird noises at night. We had a lot of cats that hung around but they didn't make noises like this. The other cat seemed to be a little weirded out by him sometimes. They would avoid him and some left entirely after he started showing up. Anyways, this particular night I walked out the back door and he was sitting in the middle of my backyard, glaring at me as usual. So I took off in a full sprint and chased him out the yard, past this line of tall bushes that blocks out the porch light. He ran into the woods and I don't ever recall seeing him again after that. I turned and started to walk back and immediately it felt like some kind of heavy wind just blew through me and I heard the unmistakable sound of a cougar. This thing sounded pissed and it couldn't have been more than 5 feet behind me. I made a good 50 yard dash to the back door in about 3 seconds. Fernando was on his way out at the time and had seen the whole event from the window in the back door. Fernando pushed the door open and I ran inside. His eyes were damn near big enough to use for dinner plates. Mine probably weren't much smaller. He said something along the lines of, Did you see that? And I replied with, No but I heard it. He said there was a tall, old looking man with red glowing eyes standing behind me and that he tried to grab me. We left the tent where it was and decided to sleep in the house that night. I started referring to him as the cat god after that. I fortified the entire yard to him that night. I remember joking around with Fernando saying something like, he could have had the whole house too if he came in to claim it. At the time, I was under the impression that it was some demon that really liked cats and just happened to live in my backyard. I didn't bother the cats after that, even the scarier ones. Later I came to the conclusion that the cat was some kind of shapeshifter and it turned into the red eyed man that mocked the cougar, or the other way around, one of those. This next story also happened in my backyard, but the other end of the line of the tall bushes that cuts through it. My dog was hooked up on a tree that stood maybe 20 feet in front of this old barn behind our house. This old barn is where we store the tractor, it's pretty much an old unfinished shack. It has three rooms and only has walls, mostly just plywood. The other two are pretty much a tin roof and some 2x4s that hold it up. So anyway, I'm pacing back and forth lengthwise of the dog runner and I'm talking to the creator, usually stopping to pet my dog. I know it's weird, but that's how I pray. I pace a lot during the summer, especially in the few days leading up to, during and after a full moon. My neighbours probably think I'm a werewolf. Anyway, I'm doing my normal pacing ritual and I start to get this really weird feeling like I'm being watched. I'm very sensitive to spirits and things like that, so I almost immediately locked on to the general direction of where I thought it was coming from, and my dog made it clear that it wasn't just my imagination when she perked up and started staring in the same direction. She started alternating between deep growls and deep hush barks. The hair down her back was standing right up. Now remember that the bushes blocks out all the porch light, and in the summertime, the trees back there are so thick that even the brightest full moon won't light up the tree line. 
Plus, the tin roof blocked out any light that did get past the trees, so it was near pitch black under that shelter. I made the mistake of saying, I know you're there, show yourself, because I'm a dumbass. That made everything get a thousand times worse. Instantly, this invisible thing starts attacking us. My dog starts pulling away, whimpering, and trying to yank her head out of her collar. My entire body tenses up from the almost electrical energy in the air. A horrible smell that I can only describe as death starts floating around. I felt paralysed and really sick to my stomach, and it only seemed to get worse. Whatever it was just seemed to be focusing its, I don't know, intent on me I guess. Some terrifying intent, and it only seemed to get worse. I started getting short bursts of horrifying visual images. My chest started to feel like someone had set my insides on fire and started squeezing my lungs, and I couldn't even run. Eventually I blacked out and went into some kind of trance. When I came back out of it, I was just standing there, staring at that spot. My entire body was sore and I felt nauseous. I unhooked the dog and walked to the back door and went inside. That night I went to sleep and didn't get out of bed for nearly two whole days. I was sick as a dog. It took more days to fully recover. After that, you couldn't pay me to go into the woods at night. Hell, I wouldn't even go back in there in broad daylight for a few months afterwards. The next few stories are dream attacks mostly. I have a lot of those these days. I figured that's due to how incredibly difficult it is to lure me outside at night. After the three physical encounters, let's just say my paranoia kicks in for literally no reason at all sometimes. The slightest odd feeling and my ass is indoors, armed to the teeth, with the house at lockdown. I just assumed Cat goes experiment with new tactics because of this. So anyway, time passes and it's mostly just little stuff for a while, and then it starts to flare up again. This thing likes to announce his presence when he starts feeling a little uppity. The next few stories are from one of his recent uppity moments. So the strange sounds, knocking on the floors, and feelings of being watched start to become increasingly more frequent, and then one night I hear this very aggressive barking coming from my front yard. Dogs pass through our yard all the time. I make friends with most of them. Shoot, I make friends with pretty much all the wildlife that I come across, even spiders and snakes. They're attracted to me for some reason, but not this dog. The first night I didn't see him, the second night I only saw his eyes. The full moon was out and the yard was very well lit that particular night. Of the place that the dog could be standing, he chose the darkest part of the yard, between a tree and a white shack like building, where we just saw junk we don't have room in the house for. The spot was basically a big ass shadow. This was the same area the dog had been barking from the night before. So I go outside and I see these two bluish glowing eyes that are pretty widely spaced apart, meaning that dog was huge. It sounded pretty damn big too. Our eyes locked and I got this very unsettling feeling, there was nothing else out there. The dog appeared to be barking at my house and me after I came outside, again very aggressively. There was something really off about this dog, assuming it was trying to lure me outside to the tree line. I fired a warning shot in the dirt a few feet in front of it. I never saw or heard it move, but it wasn't there after I fired. It came back the next night and barked around the side of my house, near my bedroom window, but back in the woods a little way. It snowed a few days later and we found its prints. They are almost as big as my hand if I spread my fingers apart as far as they'll go. I halfway thought it was just some abnormally large and mentally disturbed dog, so I decided not to shoot it. Not that that would have helped if it was what I thought it was. Probably would have just pissed it off. A few nights later, I had a dream about a cougar that seemed to shrink and grow at random as it rolled around my front yard. It was huge, it kept coming up the porch and trying to get my front door. At one point, it somehow got its head inside. It was bear sized. I was sitting with my back against the door to keep it out. It wanted in badly. I shrugged this one off as just a normal dream until the next night, when I had the exact same dream, only this one was a man in a dark hooded cloak. He wore a mask that appeared to be carved from wood and painted white. It had markings but I don't remember what they looked like. It vaguely resembled old masks that people wore during certain ceremonies. He had glowing red eyes, he seemed to grow and shrink at random and kept trying to get through my front door. It almost looked like he was floating as he crept onto the porch. It got maybe 4 feet from the door, and I just reacted to the first thing that crossed my mind. I started banging against the door and yelling like I lost my mind. I figured it might scare it away. I was very wrong. It stopped, cocked its head sideways a little, and just stared at me. This thing had to be at least 8 feet tall. It reached out its hands towards me, and I stopped dead in my tracks. The hand moved really fast, and I woke up immediately. I'm not certain of what he pointed at me. I want to say it looked like a gum, but it could have been a gloved hand. A gun was actually the last thing I would have expected, and it made it even scarier. A witch with a pistol. That was new to me. This one happened about a week following the cougar and red-eyed man dreams, somewhere around mid-January 2018. Before I get into this one, I'm going to say I've never had sleep paralysis experiences, but this sounds a lot like sleep paralysis to me, mostly because I don't remember waking up. I believe I was already awake. 
I just got in from work one night and I decided to take a nap because I was exhausted. Somewhere during that nap, I had a dream that I was attacked by a swarm of birds. I say a swarm because there was literally a fuck ton of them. Part of my language. Like kicking a huge hornet's nest with birds. They pinned me down and held me there. I struggled for a while, then I woke up. I was laying on my back in my bed. Same way the birds pinned me down in the dream. I was stone dead tired, so I closed my eyes and started to go out to sleep. And then something hit me. And then another and another and so on. This startled me a bit because for some reason I couldn't hold my eyes open. I struggled a little and realised I was still pinned down. I started to get the feeling that something was in my room with me. And I suppose it became aware that I was aware of it. I started to hear this quiet laughter, more like crackling to be precise. It was like the thing was trying to be quiet, but not too quiet. It wanted me to hear it. It kept up this evil laughter and throwing what I thought were twigs or something at me. This went on for what felt like maybe 10 minutes. The whole time I was struggling to hold my eyes open and turn my head to face it, but I couldn't. Finally, I gave up. I never went back to sleep, but after a little while, I couldn't sense it anymore. The twig throwing or whatever had stopped as well as the crackling. I slowly started to regain the control of my hands and eventually the rest of my body. I opened my eyes, sat straight up, and finally got to look at the damn corner. Nothing. What was really weird is I don't move a lot in my sleep, and I normally sleep face down. I always wake up exactly how I fell asleep. I don't sleep on my back with my hands by my sides. I don't sleep on the side of the bed either. I woke up in the same position I was pinned down during both dreams. I only ever had one dream even remotely similar to that one. It was probably the worst dream tag I've ever had. It was a small, almost doll sized child. Or I don't know, maybe it was a doll that talked like a child. Either way it was very small, sweet and innocent. Right up until it hugged me, it latched onto my chest like a leech and started saying these really horrible things. It began to morph into some kind of tiny hobbit monster. Its eyes turned into black coals, and the skin turned grey like a hoops. It began crackling and again, I became paralysed and immobile. I started to get really tired and thought I was going to die. With the last bit of energy I could muster, I managed to rip it off like a band-aid and fling it across the room. It hit a wall and its head jerked back up. My eyes met its non-eyes and I woke up. I could still feel its presence in the room. I was instantly six years old again. I pulled my feet up from under my blanket and sat Indian style in the centre of my bed. I was literally wearing a security blanket. My head was the only thing that stuck out. I sat there until I felt safe enough to move. Then I leaned back to grab my phone and used it to light up the room just enough to make me feel comfortable with the idea of getting up to turn the light on. I shit you not, six year old me wasn't half as afraid of the dark as I was at night. Back in 2008, I was on a hunting trip with my brother up near the Canadian-Michigan border. We had rented a cabin for a week, and we were looking forward to a nice quiet week until this monster spoiled it all. One night, after a day of being in the woods, we were tired and didn't feel like cooking up a meal, so I decided to jump in my truck and drive into town to get some pop and some grub while my brother stayed back to wash up. So, I drove into the town by myself, and was away about 45 minutes, probably not even a solid hour. I talked with the gal at the counter for a few, but I wanted to get back to feed my brother since he gets grouchy when he doesn't have food, and I didn't want him to be hacking on me. By the time I headed back, it was getting dark, and by the time I reached the cabin, the sun had already gone down all the way. I hit the road leading to the cabin and could see the silhouette of something big looking in one of the windows of the cabin. At first, I thought it was Everett since it looked like it was standing on two legs, but this thing looked to be too tall. So then I thought to myself, well, then it's a bear. I didn't want no bear coming around the cabin and causing trouble, so I decided to scare him off with my headlights. So I aimed my truck in his direction and flipped on my high beams. What I saw then wasn't a bear, it was a monster. When my lights hit it, it spun around and I saw the whole thing, and it was only standing on two legs. Now, you wanted my description of this thing, and I wish I had my camera handy so I could have just took a picture and gave it to you, but I wasn't expecting to see any type of monster out there. He was a big guy, like Harry from Harry and the Hendersons, but it wasn't any Sasquatch I was looking at. It looked more like a werewolf. He was more than seven feet tall, 
based on how high his head was above the top of the window. He was brown, like a chocolate lab, but the coat was different. It was shaggy like a wolf and had lighter spots in the chest and legs. He had big, big muscles like he went to the gym. His chest was really wide and his shoulders looked like Brock Lesnar, a real muscle head. He had arms that looked like they could kill you easily and these long, fingered hands with big nails at the ends and his neck was as thick as my waist almost. Even with all the power in his body, that ain't what scared the hell out of me. It was his face. He looked like he was madder than hell about something. Maybe because I interrupted him. Maybe that was just his attitude all day. Who knows? But those eyes, they will haunt me all my days. I believe in good and evil, and this thing was pure evil. The light reflected off his eyes like a night predator, and the rest of his face looked like a wolf snout, teeth, nose, ears, and all just like a wolf. When this thing spun around to face me, it pivoted on his two back legs and turned just like a human would. First, he turned his waist to look at me, then pivoted face me entirely. My body went numb and I started to shake. What in the hell was this thing? A werewolf? I don't know. The only thing I could think was that it was trying to get to my brother, and he didn't have any idea what this thing was. So, I started honking my horn and flashing my lights to get it to try to go away. Then that thing put its hands over its eyes to cover it like a person would. It gnashed its teeth at me and then ran off into the woods, and it was still on two legs. I pulled right the hell up to the cabin as close as I could, grabbed my mag light and ran into the door. Left the truck running and I was calling to my brother like a crazed man. Everett ran into the living room yelling at me, asking what the hell I was doing. And I told him, something was out there and we had to leave now. Luckily, my brother's a trusting man. 43 years of living with me, he should know when I'm serious, right? So we grabbed our rifles and mag lights and took off into the truck with haste. As we ran to the truck, we could both hear something big running in the woods next to the cabin and the loudest growl I've ever heard. That growl almost shook my insides. We tossed the guns to the truck and jumped in. Everett was shining his light into the forest, but he didn't see anything. Then we took off, and we got the hell out of there. On the way back into town, I told my brother what I had seen, and he just shook his head. I think he was letting it soak in. He looked at me and said, Arn, I think you saw yourself a werewolf. I looked up at the sky, and it wasn't a full moon. I don't know what I saw that night. We went back during the day a few days later. After going to church, I might add, and praying a lot. We got our stuff and then talked to the gentleman that rented us the cabin and told him what I had seen. He swore that he had never heard of anything like that around that before, but I got the impression he was lying to us. That's why I never go into the woods alone or unarmed anymore. In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in the backwoods of Missouri. He lived on a lot of land and the only other people who really lived on the streets were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be out there. This meant that no one ever locked their doors because random family members were always coming by for this and that. One night, while I was there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I, I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got pretty dark. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we cleverly called it vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night. So the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold themselves into a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you. Again, all the lights are off and you tried to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. We couldn't see the hand in front of your face. 
What this was meant for was the game is, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room, with the coffin, and get to the base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it, and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there's a flash of lightning. I don't know if it was already looking at the living room window, or if the lightning made me look, but the backlight of the lightning. I see a man, with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face, like he was trying to peer in, and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster. Heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding here, stay still. I sort of croaked out in, I'm here. Right as there was another flash of lightning, Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was looking towards the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was only about five feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben limped over the couch and looked to the door as the Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided it was best to let the Creeper know that people were home and to know that he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and to tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and lock all of the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes are crazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then, I remember the end very clearly, but I am less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door on the back of the house. When we've talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out in the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben, in a very calm but firm voice, say, Close the curtain. Listen to me, okay? Close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part. I just remember my fear in Ben's voice. So I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it didn't work. Whether from a storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the record, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what this is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. If you didn't have different rings for different households, but you could pick up the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon and help my uncle's CB radio, but we just couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his home. My older cousin was out on town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on the phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty while he stood watch with the little square window on the front door with the BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, He's back! He's coming up the driveway! The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the door and stepped out on the porch pointing the gun at him. Get out of here right now! Then, as we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived down the road a bit, say, You know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea what was coming. But he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we ever told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement, though. We just went on with our trip, but we never played vampire again without some mention of that night. When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas of Australia. Basically, what you did was tell them when you were available and they'd send you to a remote farm for a few weeks where you do whatever they needed done. 
It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got into a nice group of workers. When this occurred, I was working on a large property. I was told it covered roughly the same land mass as the state of Maryland in the United States, about nine hours from Sydney City, and the property itself was about 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was the middle of nowhere. I was working at the farm, clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the city. Our boss was a guy called Jeremy, who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot and the work was hard, so one day when the temperature hit about 38 degrees Celsius, about 100 Fahrenheit, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said that he knew of a water hole on the farm about 25 minute drive north. I was keen for a swim but the other guys just wanted to relax for the Arvo. So him and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading out across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker, so we drove more or less in silence. After about 20 minutes, however, he suddenly perked up and jabbed me in the ribs. Do you see that over there, beneath the two dead trees? I should mention here that if you're not familiar with the inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown and red and mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb. So you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large, blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer, we realized it was a huge, blue shipping container, just sitting here in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed. I asked him if he knew what it was, and he obviously didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove through the same area about five weeks before, and he wanted to go and see what it was. Initially, we pulled to a stop about a hundred meters away from it. At this stage, I had a really bad feeling. The whole thing wasn't right. It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expanse, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate, which I understood given it was his property, but in truth, it was I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side. All motion activated, so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, with all the security, someone obviously doesn't want us here. Let's just go. He brushed me off, however, reminding me it was his farm, and whoever I put this here was trespassing, so he wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, there was only a small padlock on the huge door. We had some bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see this was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place, and the sort of hum you hear when a hard drive is working hard. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated, albeit somewhat cluttered, office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high and plastic storage boxes scattered around, and several desks with computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage, I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desk to see if these computers would give us any idea of what the hell was going on here. My heart was racing, and all I wanted to do was bolt. We had been seen by the CCTV, so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy, on the other hand, was adamant that we had to get to the bottom of this, so I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while, but in short, neither of us very had high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. The best I can describe it from my lay position is that it was an endless list of computer talk. It was like the old Napster or LimeWare download screens looked like, just constantly picking up and receiving data 
then recording it on several windows. I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over to the far end of the container to the big pile of storage boxes. By then, I was pretty sure no one else was there and there was nowhere to hide really, but I was still incredibly on edge. I decided, against my better judgment, to see what was inside all these boxes. My brief sift through this box still makes me feel sick to my stomach. I didn't take long for me to realize that this box was full of posters, DVDs and photos of all hardcore child pornography. One thing that still gets me to this day is that it was neatly ordered into folders and smaller boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string out a sentence. Uh, I was just disgusted. I said something to the effect of, mate, get out. Child sex, go, get the fuck up. I dragged him out, composed myself, and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile phone reception, and we didn't have a satellite phone. So we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make it all the way from the town to the farm, which was about a half an hour from the town. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen until the cops arrived at almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and let them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container drawer was open, and there was fire inside. We had only two small extinguishers in the cars, and these did very little. The fire department took an hour to get there, which by that stage most of the damage was already done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment, and only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. There were various ways to get off the property, and the land mass was huge, so there was real, no real way to tell them, honestly. Since the police hadn't taken us all too seriously in the first instance, probably due to our poor explanation on the phone, Aerial surveillance was also impossible by the time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still sitting there on a the farm, as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I am a USAF, Security Forces Airman, Military Policeman. My girlfriend was at work and was swelteringly hot that day, and it began to turn into thunderstorms. My buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is a crisscross with logging roads some actively used and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days starting on the roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, and driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, the storm clouds bidding over the mountains, we set off over the road that we had never been on before, and began to drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in a thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and airily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in the park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow and got a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was especially strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as Aspen grows extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, 
meaning it would have to climb up to sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck and I noticed that he was looking back into the Aspens. At first I could see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back into the trees about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see that tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, and no main roads for miles. Surely, someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving the strange area. But we began to fear for the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if someone had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around and drive away from the camp. We need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting behind the wheel, with my heart pounding. I started walking through the trees toward the tent. I was totally keyed up on the senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built and no wood collected. The tent... The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I had turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick yelling. Let's go! Let's go! Let's get the fuck out of here! Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw an old beat-up Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated any way he could. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman. And though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know, know if that person was male or female. I called the state police, and they promised to send a trooper out there to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and women's clothing were all gone. Though, he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove, I have not returned to that area, and do not intend to. To preface this, I went to say last year, I spent about 32 days in the woods, either scouting, hunting, or fishing. The year before that, I spent about 22 days. This doesn't include my regular hunts and camping adventures, which in the past three years adds up to just over 100 days. I've been hunting since I was nine, and I spent a lot of time outdoors, in various different parts of the US and in Canada. I've seen and heard a lot of strange shit, but this takes the cake. I was in Cahuta, North Georgia wilderness, for seven days scouting for bears, wild hogs, and deer, prepping for a hunting trip later that year. I had hiked in about 10 miles, and then went off trail for another 3 to 5 miles. Basically, I was out in the middle of nowhere. Since I was alone, I was using a hammock that was built into a bug net, and I had a rain fly over it. I spent about 3 days halfway up a mountain, just looking for a good place to hunt. I saw three to four good sized bears, about ten hogs and came across some good sized deer. On the fourth day, I was going to head down to a small stream that I had marked on my GPS and then set up camp, restock on water and prep for the two day hike back. I could have gone faster but I wanted to be able to look for any animal sight along the way. As I was approaching the small stream, I noticed a tent which I was excited to see as I had been completely alone for a few days, and it's always nice to run into another hiker. Generally us wilderness folks are pretty down to earth. 
As I got closer to the tent, I noticed that there was a small pack on the ground, just outside of it. I figured the person wouldn't have been that far from their camp, so I set up my camp about 30 yards away, and with about 4 hours of daylight, started cooking some dinner. Two hours later, I started to wonder where this person was. Given that I was in the wilderness and it was a one plus day hike out, there wasn't much I could do, but I did hike around the site, making a circle as I went out to make sure I looked for any signs of struggle in case of a bear attack, or maybe they had an injury. I got about one fourth of a mile from the campsite, walking a circle, but I couldn't find anything. As night came, no one showed. I started a fire in hopes that the person would be able to find their way back and have some light. Fires burn really bright and are very easy to see from far away. After eating, searching, and hoping that the person was going to make it back, I called it a night. I had a small flask with me and took a couple sips of whiskey, jumped in my hammock with my pistol, and attempted to go to sleep. I sleep pretty hard. I mean really hard, regardless of where I am. It literally annoys my friends because I can always seem to fall asleep and stay asleep, regardless of where in the world we are. But this might, this night was different. I felt like something was off, but I figured it was just me worrying about this person, who by all my accounts was completely missing. So for the first time in my life, I woke up to the sound of what I thought was footsteps, but not in the sense of footsteps on leaves, but heavy-footed person that would make on the walking of an old floor. It was extremely loud. I got my gun, grabbed my headlamp, stored in all my small compartments above me, and waited to see if it would stop. Right at the moment it did. That moment, I saw something that scared the shit out of me. On my rainfly, the glimmer of a flashlight, faint but there. I shouted, Hello? And right then, Ah, uh, it sounded like ten people suddenly ran away from every direction. I, I dropped out of my hammock and onto the ground, frantically turning my headlamp shining all around me. But I didn't see shit. My heart was racing pretty bad, but I thought it might have just been the reflection of the moon on the rain fly. Yeah, that was it. And those footsteps running away were probably armadillos or something, even though their eyes shine and they are pretty noticeable and easy to spot. Problem was there was no moon, and I had never seen an armadillo above 2,000 feet. Not to say they don't live up there, just never seen one. And for some reason, the campsite I set up by was gone. The fire had been put out by water. It was apparent because there was not a damn cold in the thing. I thought for sure it was about 4 a.m., but I had only been asleep about an hour. And at this point, I wanted to leave, but hiking out of the wilderness while it's dark is always a bad idea. So I grabbed my flask, took a swig of whiskey, removed my rain fly so I could see out of my hammock around to the area I was in and tried my hardest to go back to sleep. I was laying down when I saw some light hit the trees above me. It was clear it was coming from downstream. I got out of my hammock and started yelling, Hey, y'all need any help? No response. I saw whatever was putting out the light and it spun around and started heading back downstream. Really, really fast. At this point, my body had pumped through adrenaline and then all the blood that I had and I was exhausted from it all, and I was finally able to fall asleep, and woke up around 7am. When I did, I noticed that my water filter I had left out was missing. It's a gravity filter and it hangs out from a tree filtering down into my main bladder that I put in my backpack and my water bladder sitting on the base of the tree. It looked like it was cut down in the middle with a knife. They cut down to my bear bag, which had food in it, and took some of it. The creepiest part of it all was, is that they went through my bag, which was under my hammock while I was sleeping. I checked the bear bag before I went to sleep the second time, and it was still there, hanging. And before I went back to sleep the second time, it was still there, hanging, and my bag under my hammock did not be touched. I packed up all my shit and hightailed it out of there, keeping my pistol close to me and moving as fast as I could. I ended up making the hike back in just under 15 hours. I hiked the trail part at night because I wasn't about to spend another night out there. I didn't see anyone out on my way out. There were no cars parked at the trailhead and the DNR said they had only seen my car there. Since then, I haven't gone out there without any friends. I reported all this to the local DNR and they looked at me like I was crazy. And maybe I am.
Tennessee has some real bum fucky people out in nature. I hiked all around in high school, made some good memories with a girl enveloping nature. Tennessee has some good roads to popular hiking sites and tons of mini trails branching off. Sometimes you need to know what to look for as far as a trail marker goes, but the interesting ones are always good ways out. There's one spring waterfall that spills across a mossy, granite wall, towering over a shallow stream that empties into a decent sized pond. I went out there with a friend last time and we got separated on the way out. I have no freaking clue how this happened. We've each been hiking for 10 years. I've run over it 1,000 times in my head and it has to be this one ledge system. To get to the top of the fall, you need to take a longish detour that has a lot of old wooden railings and a three-way branching ledge system. Okay, so I've taken all three routes and ended up at the same spot. They take maybe three to four minutes to blast through and they're kind of like rocky corridors. I don't take the left one anymore because I'm 90% sure these big stains in the middle are blood and I don't want to know what happened there. It's odd because the left is by far the most inviting. Flowers bloom and vines are etched into the moss matted bedrock. Anyways, I'm 45 seconds ahead of her and opt for the right of the path when I realize I should tell her to avoid the left. It's really hard to reverse given the sloping angle of the path and a few short drops that become narrow climbs. Fuck it. Faster if I speed through and yell down. I get out to the right corridor, swing around where the middle path drops off and yell. No reply. She took left. I run over and climb into the left corridor, thinking she saw the stains and freaked out. It looks like someone got bludgeoned to death, to be fair. She's fucking gone. Ashley! Nothing. And that's what made my hair stand up. I literally heard nothing. No birds, no hum of the forest, not even wind. I traced left all the way back and noted a few side passages. If you miss a couple of jumps, no bodies were in the middle though. Good. I figured I may as well get to the top of the falls where I can somewhat get an aerial view. I get there and Ashley is sitting there waiting for me. She says she took the left path with the trail guide. What? There are no trail guides. There are rangers, but she knows the difference. They wouldn't be in the rock labyrinth. This guy had a uniform on and it said trail authority. She knew, I was thinking based on my face, that she was crazy. Cause I reversed that course, and we did it ASAP without us saying anything loud, and man, it's weird when you know you're watched. So yeah, we pretend we are going back to the car real quick, to get more water, so I left the fish food on a little crevice like I always did, and we left. She showed me this weird side patches that could not have existed a year before. I walked all the way around. And you had to crouch, but you could walk through the labyrinth if you get through it. Hindsight, we should have taken another way. I think he lives in those tunnels, she said, and crept trying to lead her in different directions. But she just followed the light and saw him standing in the tunnel as she walked the rest of the way to the top. That man was very creepy. He was sitting there, staring at her. That means he also knew that I was looking for her. That means she followed him before seeing the blood spatters all over the floor and walls, and that's not the totally fucked part. The fucking fish food on my hood of my car. It was put there by someone. Her water bottle was gone too. She had it cabareneered in her pack, so he must have snuck up and taken it at some point. We hiked fast too, and never went back out, and we refused to ever go back there. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button. It helps me out a ton. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you don't miss any videos. I upload multiple times a week videos similar to this one.